Well, then, that is some partial analysis of the particles that are in the world. There's these families of it for interchange, and there are these hierarchies associated with the strangeness. The question is, is there any more symmetry in the system? But for instance, is it possible that an exchange of a neutron with a lambda might make no difference in nuclear forces? Or some other possible combination, that if you change a P, a proton to a sigma, and a C, uh, a cascade to a sigma naught, or something like that, in a certain particular combinations, it makes no difference. People have tried very many attempts to find such additional symmetries. In order to help them, they've used the mathematics of what's called group theory. Uh, group theory is just thing, but the mathematicians have analyzed a lot the problem of what happens if you exchange one thing with another and then something with something else. Uh, what is the net result of all that? So that the mathematicians have prepared for the physicists the necessary mathematics called group theory to analyze this. At any rate, many types of possible systems of exchanges have been suggested to understand the way the world works, and uh, in each case sometimes you would predict something that wasn't exactly in accord with experiment, and it didn't look very hopeful. As a matter of fact, I myself, after playing around with Gelman, trying uh, together, we tried many combinations, came to the conclusion there probably wasn't any other symmetry in the system. The problem is very hard. Why should it be hard? If a thing is symmetrical, Ordinarily, with one glance at the eye, you could see immediately that it's symmetrical. So why is it that it's not possible to look right away at the character of the particles that are discovered and see the symmetry? There are two reasons. First, the symmetry is not perfect. In the case of the pattern that you can replace neutron and pro by proton, that is very accurate, but it is not exactly perfect in nature because the two protons interact electrically while the neutrons don't. But if we leave out the electricity, it's quite perfect. The electricity is only one or so percent. However, we know already, because the masses of these particles are so different, that the any other symmetry that must be there must be quite a bit off by 10 or 20 percent. To look for a somewhat symmetrical thing takes more skill than to notice a symmetrical thing. The other part of the problem is that we have missing parts. If you had a vase which you knew was nearly symmetrical and half of it was broken off, or nearly half of it was broken off, it would be a little bit hard to tell the character, the pattern of symmetry. So that when there's only a limited number of particles, it gets somewhat difficult. For example, there was known a set of four particles, in addition to the, this set, which belong together in the kind of family that these belong. Then it became clear that there was another set of three more that were similar for such exchanges. And it was part of a suggestion. There was a suggestion made by Gelman and independently by Professor Neumann, of a certain particular pattern of interchanges among all these particles, which uh, would permit an understanding of what was known so far, but would only permit these four, provided these three, and another pair, and, and still a third particle, all by itself, were existed in the world. They, when they made this up, only knew about this and a little bit about that, and were very reluctant to suggest that it was true because there were so many missing pieces it was unbelievable. However, when these particles turned out to exist and to fit their triangle of interconnections, which they expected would occur, they became more uh, ambitious and suggested that, in fact, the theory is right. In order to make this theory right, however, this particle here was missing. Now, many of the other symmetry systems predicted new particles, and many new particles were found. But in the confusion, uh, the particles had no particular special properties, and uh, one could make an accident. That is, nature did have a particle something like what you were looking for. But this new particle that was predicted by the gelman neyman theory was very peculiar. It had strangeness minus three. And it, this theory predicted that they should, with strangeness minus three, which means that it would only be able to disintegrate in three steps before it got to neutron and proton. This was so unique and definite a prediction that the theory would be made and broken very easily by experiment. So the very interesting question was, do they have the right pattern? Is there an extension, a new kind of additional symmetry among the particles, an additional fact to simplify our understanding by which the families of two, three, and so on can be combined into one element two elements, and thus take our 90 particles and replace them by two, three, or four groups. If so, of course, we're making enormous progress. And the big question was, experimentally, does this omega minus exist or not? This was a moment 
that's characteristic of physics, that's one of the big thrills and mysteries. How is it possible, by looking at a piece of nature, to guess how another part must look where you've never been before? How is it, it's only in modern times that man has really been able to guess what nature is going to do in situations that he's never looked at before. And here's an example of it. With many strange particles, by looking at those which you've seen already, it is possible to guess that there must be something that you haven't looked at yet. The reason this is possible is partly man's ingenuity, but obviously more important is nature's inner simplicity. To look for this particle is a typical, dramatic, scientific investigation. So the two ingenious men, Gelman and Neyman, waited for two years to see whether nature recognized their ingenuity. She did. The particle was found. 